Hello and welcome to today's webinar, CCPA and Ongoing Data Privacy Opt-in, Opt-out, and Consent Optimizations. We're glad you're spending your morning, your afternoon, your evening with us, wherever you are in the world. Uh, we're going to spend about 45 minutes today uh, going over this topic. Um, and as a reminder, and for those who have come in, this is a part of an ongoing master class that Telium is putting together on CCPA. Um, so we're going to talk about some of the basics and fundamentals of CCPA today to get everybody refreshed. But really, we've spent two classes going into a deep dive on the basics, on the differences between CCPA and GDPR. So today, our purpose for Julian and I going through and, and building this webinar is talking about consent and consent optimizations. Uh, in a future webinar, we'll go through and talk a little bit more of the nuts and bolts some of the technical implementations that you want to think about when you put this together. Today's talk is a little bit more strategy and high level. One thing to note that Julian and I, unless you're holding a legal degree that I don't know about, we're not lawyers. Uh, and so we advise everybody on this call to consult with their own internal legal counsel to, about their own specific CCPA regulations uh, and needs. Uh, for their particular uh, applications and websites. What we will be doing today as well is going through some examples, some good, uh, some uh, aware, some optimizations could be needed. It's a, all in purpose of us showing you kind of the different ways that you can get to compliance, and then we're going to be talking about ways that you can move past it. So those examples that you'll see today are just that examples. There are no way indications of consent, compliance, non-compliance, uh, we need to know a lot more about those brands in order to make those calls. And so there are examples. We think they're helpful in starting to understand some of the options and some of the, the actual consent preference managers out there. Um, but I think that's all of our housekeeping items today. Don't want to spend too much time on the intro. We want to get to the content. So let's move on. So today's speakers, uh, you'll be hearing from myself. Uh, my name is Jake Spencer. I'm a product marketing manager at Helium. Uh, I've spent a majority of my career working for enterprise technology brands in all aspects of branding, digital marketing, and I started my career out off as an analyst, so a little bit in the analytics space as well. Uh, Julian Llorente is also here. Julian is our Director of Product and Data Privacy. He brings a wealth of knowledge on data privacy as he spent the last several years navigating GDPR at the Lufthansa Group, where he was also responsible for the harmonization of web data. He also brings a master's in data science along to the table as well, and we know we have some data scientists on the call today. So let's go over a quick agenda. We're going to spend uh, some time getting everybody up to speed, some CCPA basics and quick facts, opt-in and opt-out requirements of GDPR and CCPA, and talking a little bit about how those differ, um, why you should be optimizing consent, and five ways to optimize consent management. We'll do a summary and we'll do some Q&A at the end. So that's about uh, going to be the run of the 45 minutes today. So let's start off with some CCPA quick facts. Uh, as I said, this is part of an ongoing master class. Look in the links and attachments section to find kind of the deep dives that we've taken into everything CCPA, the 101, the differences between CCPA and GDPR. But let's talk about what CCPA has introduced. So CCPA has introduced new consumer rights uh, that every brand should really be aware of at a very high level. Again, we've gone through in detail, but let's go over these rights uh, really quickly, and we'll talk about how those relate to consent management as well a little bit further down the line. So right one, uh, the right to know what personal information has been collected, where it was sourced from, and the purposes for which it is being used. Right two, the right to know if personal information has been sold or disclosed and to whom, and the categories of that information. Right three, the right to equal service and price even after opt-out, and we'll talk a little bit, we'll talk actually a lot about opt-out today. Uh, right four, the right to access their personal information, so consumers right to access their personal information. Right five, the right to have personal information erased or be able to erase their personal information. And right six, the one that we'll be talking about quite a bit today, the right to opt-out of the sale of personal information. And that's something that we wanted to spend a, a, a slide on as well is the opt-in and the opt-out. Sometimes they get muddled, the waters are a little bit murky, and so Julian is going to talk us through kind of the differences there with opt-in and the GDPR and opt-out with CCPA. So hello everybody, it's Julian speaking. Um, so uh, opt-out versus opt-in, uh, this slide actually holds information that I've been talking the most about since I joined Telium uh, beginning of this year. 
so to begin with, within GDPR, as you may already know, are familiar with, we have uh, exactly as within CCPA also the six lawful bases, um, which actually are the consent-driven ones. So we need to actually consent uh, or opt in uh, in order to gather data or track data. Uh, the contracts need to have to be in place, the legal obligation in general, uh, the vital interests of the company or the vendor, uh, the public tasks and legitimate interests. Uh, we will have these six lawful bases within GDPR within our appendix as soon as we share the slides, so don't bother about it. Uh, it will be documented as well for you to look at. Um, then within GDPR, uh, the content must be freely given, as you already know. Um, it needs to be informed and ambiguous and receive prior to any data collection. Uh, in general, the personal data is uh, directly or indirectly related to a person within uh, the European states, uh, and in general, sensitive data requires a high level, so there's actual uh, the differentiation between PII data and sensitive data in general. Um, for the CCPA requirements in general, we have the implicit opt-in, uh, which means there's no need for consent. Uh, this is actually the major difference uh, within the implementation. Uh, and in my experience, we have uh, used most of my time in order to explain this uh, to American companies because uh, in com direct comparison with GDPR, which is opt-in driven, and we have to actually collect the consent before we can uh, trigger tax or cookies within CCPA, it's not needed. So there's no need for an implicit opt-in. Uh, therefore, the opt-out instructs, therefore, the companies uh, to not sell data. That's the major difference. Uh, we'll go through that within the next couple of slides with examples too so that you can actually understand how this reflects an actual implementation. Um, furthermore, the business uh, cannot ask again for within 12 months for the opt-outs. So as soon as a user opt opted out within a website or an application, uh, after 12 months, we are allowed to ask again. Then opt-in for children under 16 years old, that means there are regulations for children, which differ a bit from GDPR. Um, as mentioned before by Jake, we will not go into details. We already have covered that within other uh, two webinars, so you can take a look at that if you need further details about this. Um, and the last one, uh, CCPA actually provides a full list of uh, PII, which is considered as PII, so that's actually pretty helpful in uh, comparison to GDPR. But that's in general, so the, the biggest difference being the opt-in versus the opt-out requirements for it. What that actually means, uh, we will show you that by explaining why you should uh, be optimizing content in general. Um, and I will hand over to Jake. Yeah. So yeah, we, we as Julian and I were preparing this webinar, um, we really thought about you know, why consent is an optimization. We see a lot of brands get to um, compliance and get to that step one and, and maybe even have the best of intentions to return and say, you know, I've got my consent management set up, we're compliant, we've got things ready to go. But really talking about optimizing consent is something that, um, you know, we, we're starting to see some brands get there with GDPR because they've had a year and a half head start on those of us who are thinking about the CCPA. But um, often we get to compliance and, and stop there. So let's talk about why you should be optimizing consent. There's a few reasons. Um, I've spent my entire career in marketing and in and, and digital marketing. And my, most of my career, I've spent optimizing funnels. All of us understand what a funnel is. We're trying to get somebody to complete the action. And with these new uh, data privacy regulations like the CCPA, we've introduced a new piece of the funnel, right, which is consent. Consent is now going to be at the front of our websites. Perhaps it's even the front of our, uh, or perhaps it's even the first brand touch that somebody has with our, with our brands, with our clients, with those who we're doing digital marketing for. And so we really need to think about that experience as it relates um, to being a transparent company and being able to provide privacy options to those who are going to uh, land on our applications and our websites. So uh, think of CTPA really as an opportunity and not a cost. Getting it right can be a significant competitive advantage. I, I, I like to think of this as we've all kind of accepted at this point the Amazon practice, the quick service, the personalized experiences, and every brand is kind of required to be at that bar because they set that bar so high. The brands, as we go through these years and as these data privacy uh, regulations become more common, 
And the biggest brands start to optimize consent experiences, privacy practices, and be able to be more transparent. Those same brands is going to be the same exact bar that every brand is going to be expected to hit, similar to Amazon, but now with data privacy, now with consent options, now with cookie preferences. And so let's talk about really how you can go through and optimize that experience because it has some real ramifications. Opt-out rates currently, according to Adweek in their recent survey uh, in October 2019 uh, of media and publishing companies, found that 87% of consumers would opt out of ad targeting under CCPA terms. Now, what's that going to result in for us as marketers and us as brands? It's going to result in less revenue for potentially, but definitely going to result in lack of trust or, or showcase lack of trust in your brand if you have that high of an opt-out rate. So let's talk about some ways, and, and Julian's going to take us through some ways that we can optimize consent because it has real meaning uh, and a real impact on kind of how we can go through that. Yes, thank you, Jake. So to add one of my experience for the last three years working with uh, one of the biggest uh, European airline companies in regards to why it is important to focus on the optimization of content or opt-in and opt-out in general, um, is that after we implemented uh, for GDPR, the first content manager, we had from one day to another drop of 80% of personalization data, uh, which actually reflected in all the marketing use cases that we have. So content management is not only the read requirement, it's also a major impact for your website and your service in general. So that's why it underlines also why it is so important to optimize content and not just think about the legal requirements, which is good in the first step, but what is after we have implemented the read requirements. Um, so that's what we'll do today. So the five ways of optimizing the content management is actually a reflection of the experience working within GDPR for the last one and a half years and guiding through not only one but three major companies exactly through that process. So let's start with the first one. So uh, the first one that we have over here, uh, which we call minimize web or app impact and maximize transparency, is also uh, connected to the fact uh, that GDPR is opt-in driven and TCPA is opt-out driven. The reason why we call it opt-out driven is because the user can actually uh, select the do not track, uh, do not sell my data uh, option, which actually opts out of that categorization. And this is reflected then in the way we can implement uh, such content manager. And the first step, meaning that there is no reason to implement an intrusive uh, pop-up within CCPA, um, which we see quite often currently, and we'll show you a couple of examples for that. So there's no need for a pop-up as no opt-in or specific opt-in is required in the first step. Uh, the content manager uh, preference in general don't need to take up the whole page, so there's no need to break the user journey in general. Uh, the user should still, be, uh, should still be possible for the user to interact with the website without interacting with the CCPA vendor. Um, also, as a third point, is the vendor-specific opt-out will be of interest. Um, that's the major step for the reason that the user is now the opportunity to opt out of a whole categorization, uh, means of a whole large category of your category of selling data, or you can provide options to that that the user can specifically pinpoint what actual vendors he wants to opt out from. This will have a major impact on your opt out rates in general. Um, how this reflects in an example, um, we can take a look at the New Yorker. Uh, New York is a news website. Uh, they have implemented a non-intrusive content manager, which we can see in this little example. Um, and as you may directly see, it's like the user interaction that you have on that website is not blocked by pop-up. Um, as for the reason as mentioned before, no need for opt-ins here. So uh, the, the, the banner by itself is uh, showing a bit of legal text to it, but also offering preferences and additional information. Uh, the management uh, within the banner don't break up the user journey in general, and the colors of buttons make options transparent and obvious. What that means is that there is no confusion for the user. Uh, you can still interact with the website, and your opt-out rates uh, will not be influenced by it. So you don't push the consumer to actually opt out of something if there is no need for it. Um, now, if the user interacts with a do not sell my personal information or data by clicking on the button, uh, a pop-up appears, uh, which we can see right over here. Within that optimization stuff, we can see right here that we have hefty legal text uh, 
uh, that means a description of everything what they're doing in a language with it's not easy understandable for the end user, uh, which will quite confuse them. Uh, also, we see that the uh, opt out is only provided by one categorization uh, without actually really explaining in detail what they're doing. So that means that that customer or that user at the end of the day, um, by being confused, will most probably opt out of the selling of data uh, without knowing what kind of benefits he's actually lacking in and without understanding. So that's a major step to just take on. Um, and just to uh, make it clear, CCPA, no need for pop-ups, no need for intrusive uh, implementations, and therefore always take a look at the user journey in general. So from that uh, implementation point, uh, now an example, how it could look like if you do an intrusive implementation here on Fox 5 San Diego News, uh, so we can see that they actually have implemented something which is better than nothing. Still, uh, the user is just uh, has to interact with something, which is the pop-up, which is shown in this uh, example. And here we can actually see that an explicit consent is asked uh, or requested uh, without actually showing why or what background there is. There's just an I accept button, but actually there is no need for an opt-in. So this is a GDPR implementation covered within CCPA, uh, which is confusing on different levels, but um, and the button interactions are actually misleading. So there is no easy access to opt out in general, so no button interaction for that, and no text description. So within the optimization step of transparency, this is really important uh, to show exactly these steps. Also, we see a lack in context, transparency, and meaning of the banner. So there is no explanation why a banner is shown, why the user interaction is now broken into steps. Uh, so that's something that you should uh, immediately focus on if you have such kind of implementations to think about exchanging that for banner which is not as intrusive as a pop-up and it doesn't interact with your or doesn't break up your user journey in general. So from that optimization point going to the next one, uh, so here we have now the uh, provide a value exchange. Uh, this is really crucial. Um, as soon as you have the first step, that means your legal requirements uh, now we are in that spot that we have to explain to customer why we are actually uh, showing a banner or content and also explain why it is necessary that the user understands before opting out what will happen to his data and what he's missing. That means within CCPA we have the opportunity to have a value exchange for money. Still the consumer information itself is value driven. So pre by presenting the actual benefit to a user before or the user opts out, uh, we will uplift our uh, opt-out rates, our minor opt-out rates. And what that means in an example within the offline commerce is pretty simple. So in the experience that we go shopping, for example, uh, we buy something. The cashier will actually a lot of times ask us for an email or an address for an actual benefit. This benefit is most of the time put in in the first step. That means the why this data is needed. Um, is always explained as you will get a 10% discount, for example, therefore I need your email, which is exactly the same fact that should be implemented within this explanations. Uh, so adding a value exchange to your content management descriptions. So uh, over here we see also um, the same banner implementation, but now on a GQ website. Um, within the GQ website, the banner actually provides, as already explained, the button interaction for do not sell, but still they go the extra mile. Within that banner, we have uh, small boxes that explain the purposes of it, the reasons why this data is needed, so a bit of background about the general why, so the user can actually gather information before taking a decision, which will most probably end in uh, opting out of your categorization that you actually choose. So, here we can see the real benefit of it because the user can, uh, as an option to interact with it, still can use the website. So if needed, can deep dive, can deep dive into it without leaving the website or taking a look at another page and breaking up the whole user journey. So uh, on the next step or next optimization step we have is understand your audience in humanized language. Uh, this is actually something that I've spent quite some time on it. So it took me more or less a year in order to understand that we have this optimization opportunity. 
which means we all know that we're doing analytics on our websites. For marketing use cases, we're using segmentations, we're trying to understand who the end user is, or who our audiences are, and the same step should be combined with our content management. So as uh, you may already know, within a lot of articles online, we can see that the users are actually starving to get more information in precise language and straightforward language about uh, what actually company is doing. So by actually explaining that in a humanized language and understanding who the audience in general is, this will uh, boost your reputation in general and be more trustworthy towards users at the end of the day uh, with clear policies and it also uh, it is less uh, 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 less sorry <laughs> that it's less obvious or it is more obvious sorry for that it's more obvious what you're actually doing so what your business is driving for what data is needed for and it reduces this opportunity and feeling towards users that you're actually hiding something which was what we learned within uh, Lufthansa implementing the content manager. But a lot of users um, expressed their quality of feedback that the company is actually hiding reasons why data is needed. Um, so as soon as we noticed that, we definitely tried to uh, implement ways to understand the audience in humanized language and explain everything in detail as we possibly could. Then on to the next point. So this is one of my most favorite ones because within this optimization step, um, I will hand over uh, to Jake also because it is always important to work for across teams um, to not only take a look from legal perspective or just from implementation approach or technical approach that we have, it is also really, really important to work together with your marketing teams. Why this is so important, why it is important to make it a brand touch point, uh, Jake, will yeah. explain that in further details. Yeah, so uh, you know, it was interesting as we as we looked across those of you who registered for this webinar and those who have been registering for the master class in general. It really varied of marketing titles, legal titles. Uh, you know, some data science titles showed up because obviously this these types of regulations and data privacy requirements are going to impact data and analytics functions, segmentation for marketing. And so, really, what we saw was kind of you know, everybody who might be tasked at one point or another with some requirements or some thoughts needed on um, coming together to, to get a CCPA implementation down and get your company ready to go on some of these optimizations. But as Julian mentioned, it's really important, especially if you're in the data and legal side, to work with marketing because you can make this a brand touch point. And as I said at the very beginning, um, you know, when, really, when, when you're working with consent managers and consent management platforms, you're starting a brand conversation from the very beginning when somebody lands on your website, and now that consent manager, whether you like it or not, is going to be one of the first things that your audience interacts with when they make it to your website. Thus, it's really important for marketing to be involved with this optimization to make it a brand touch point, make it an engaging experience, help uh, your uh, audience and your customers understand why data is valuable to their experience on your website. Really, the, the one sentence that we wrote down here on this slide, with the right approach, brands can turn regulatory, regulatory requirements into brand touch points. That's like the very cream of the crop, right? Uh, and one of the things that we thought about, and I should have put the links in, and I will after, uh, after this webinar uh, is finished, um, but one of the, the great examples that I think we'll eventually get to that's very applicable here We've all taken flights at one point or another, and before we get into the flight situation and we actually take off, we always see a legal video, right? We always see the requirements, legal speak, but uh, in some sort of brand touch point of what we need to do on that flight to be legally safe. The airlines are going to be required to show it all of the time. It's that first interaction and touch point. And you see in almost every single airline, I haven't flown an airline, I think, ever, that hasn't had that video be branded in some way. And Virgin Airlines was really the first company to do this, and thus everybody else followed along. But that's a similar example, right, where an airline company is legally required to show you these videos, to walk you through these steps. However, every single one of them has uh, made it an engaging experience, a brand touch point, an opportunity for you to connect with their brand. And so your consent manager shouldn't break your brand's language. 
your brand, use your brand voice in conjunction with your con, your content your content manager and your consent manager. If not, you're going to end up breaking that customer experience at least a little. If your consent approach is resulting in too many opt-outs and you haven't had a major breach or incident that would you know warn people away anyway, you really want to consider optimizing that experience to add more value uh, and be integrated into the overall brand experience of your website. I think that's kind of the, the very tip of the top when you have that and you sit and you're feeling like your consent management experience is a nice step one and then going into the website experience. It's a really big win, I think, for marketing teams, and it's something that data and, and legal professionals should be working on in order to hit this optimization point. I'll add that link uh, to the Virgin <laughs> Airlines video because it's pretty good uh, here right after the webinar. And that moves us on to optimization five. Um, so we, this, of course, is a Telium webinar, uh, and we really, really wanted to talk a little bit about talking, managing consent across the data supply chain. So at the very beginning, you have consent, you have you know, data that uh, either you are opting into or opting out of, and then those preferences, how brands are starting to manage those downstream for marketing, for data and analytics, is going to become extremely important. And we've really thought about that for quite a while here at Helium. Um, there's really many ways to go about approaching consent collection with data collection and orchestration, but not all are equal. Um, like I said, we've been thinking about governance and data privacy for years, and as a result, we've actually built a consent manager natively into our Telium IQ Tag Management solution, something that you're not going to find with free or add-on tag management tools. And there's really a couple reasons for that across kind of these departments that we've talked about that are going to be impacted. So for marketing, it's really about reducing workload and managing your consent and your tags in two different places. When you have that all unified, you're able to at least reduce workload in uh, managing preferences, making sure tags are firing correctly in a single place rather than in multiple places. For compliance and data governance, you're going to be able to, with this unified tag management and consent management solution, set up for CCPA and then be able to easily duplicate data workflows and optimization or, and automations for future regulations in a few clicks. So if you say, hey, I, I want to get set up properly for CCPA, that's what's on my mind today. And we all know that regulations will continue to come down at either various different states. So you say, hey, now we've got to get GDPR ready. That unified uh, opportunity is going to allow you and our consent management, our consent manager is going to allow you to do that and keep all of your data flows and automations in place that you've already worked on, be able to duplicate that in a few clicks. And last but not least, analytics, better data insights and steering. You're going to be able to go through and collect data up front where it's created at its creation on the web and on the application through your tag manager and be able to pull that through for data and analytics insights. For example, right, if you have um, uh, an opt-out occur, now you can uh, now our Telium users have that information in uh, a CDP or an API hub, and you can set up an automation process to provide the full CCPA compliance by not triggering the connectors. Or you can go through and understand really at a user level um, why that opt-out may have occurred. But really, our, our approach and really Telium's place in uh, CCPA goes much broader than that. And we have a, um, a concept called the data supply chain. Uh, and that's really something that we wanted to talk through is throughout all of this, mapping consent throughout the data supply chain, how do we do it, what types of things are available, what things should you be thinking about. And Julian has gone through uh, and actually you know, started this process. And so we felt it would be best to have Julian go through and, and really talk about what's critical at each stage of this data supply chain when you're talking about CCPA. So uh, exactly right. So uh, first to mention, so what you see right here is data supply chain defined by Telium. Uh, if you are maybe now kind of confused or still confused within the CCPA and GDPR kind of environment, uh, don't bother. I was exactly at the same spot when GDPR happened in Europe. Um, and what actually helped me was exactly this overview. Uh, so being a customer from Telium for three years, um, I was exact on that step that I had to think about how uh, am I going to be GDPR ready with these companies? How will the data flow look like? What do we do? So I will guide you step by step through all of that, that you have common and broad understanding what it actually means. Um, so being the first step in general is the collection part. 
So where you collect data in general and also your content, uh, so opt-ins and opt-outs, depending on what kind of GDPR and CCPA implementation you have. So that means that all your data sources, websites, apps, offline data, whatever you have in there, uh, can actually collect data always connected to the content. Um, that's the first step that all companies are in the first step focusing on, so collecting and content. And the second step is standardizing this data in a common language so that we can actually use it to then transform and enrich it in a third step. What that actually means is nothing else than from a legal perspective, um, I was working with legal quite a lot, and it was always a bit difficult to explain what kind of data is being tracked from what different kind of sources and how can we provide a simple and easy overview of what we're doing. These two steps actually provide exactly that solution, exactly that answer. So what are we actually collecting? And to translate it into a common language in regards of data, this will actually help you to talk to your legal teams and to talk to marketing and provide information about what is actually happening. And the third step, you transform and enrich. What it actually means is that you can use this information, summarize it together, and actually with the correct content, for example, do profiling and understand who your customers are, uh, do your analytics part with it, enrich your data with offline sources that you have, combine that with offline connected uh, content. Uh, if you have, for example, a call center, which can also influence your content because a user could call in uh, ask what content was provided on your online platform and therefore change it or maybe adapt it to whatever needs they have. So this transformation enrichment is really a crucial point because that's actually what it's, it's like the heart of your content management in general. It's not only collecting it, but enriching it so you have a deep understanding of what is happening. As soon as you have done the third step, uh, we do integrations, which means there are connectors connected to it, which then in the last step I activated. What that actually means, it's pretty simple. If I pick an example, for example, you have with the marketing, your email communications. So you collect your data, you collect your content, you standardize it, you transform and enrich it. Maybe the user was already visiting your platform. Then you integrate a connector to your email providers, which actually take care of the task of sharing that email or writing that email, reaching out to the customer. And this whole journey can now be automated because you already collected the content. All of this information is in real time and integrated with all of the connectors and vendors that you actually want to communicate to. So it simplifies the way that you actually implement your content data supply chain and it will help not only the implementation part, the technical people, the data scientists, the legal teams, it will help all of you across teams. So it helps you to communicate and it helps you to interact with everybody within your company and actually makes it pretty simple. Uh, within the last three years, I actually implemented the collect part, the standardization part, and before I went and joined Telium, uh, I did the transform and enrichment part. The integration and activation is still something that the company is working on, but that's actually the way to go with it. So this is the heart of content management. It's not only about collecting, it's always about the whole journey that your data has to go through and all the data flows that are connected to it. So what I did also is um, to map out um, to all these different steps, um, all the important CCPA and GDPR terms that we have. So the first two steps, as already mentioned, uh, they get all the information about opt-outs, about do not sell, uh, auditing, in general, the opt-in rates that you have, so all your collecting and standardization part. Within the transform and enrichment section, we have the data staging, the data transformation, and the right to erasure. That means as soon as the customer reaches out and you want, you he or she wants to have the data to delete it, that's something that now we can automate because we have that transform and enrichment part and we actually have that in real time. So all the transactions that are done within data are represented within this stack. Within the last two sections that we have of the data supply chain, we have the integration, the transmission and traceability, so which I already explained in detail, but that's exactly that. So we can actually orchestrate everything that we do throughout our connectors and communicate and automate it in standardized way in real time with all the vendors that need to be connected to do all your marketing use cases or whatever use cases you actually want to do with your data because you now know in real time what level of content the user has provided to you. So that's in general a quick and brief overview about product. It's not too technical and I hope we can help you with that to provide you a bit of information what it's actually useful for.
So I will uh, go ahead and, and summarize, and then we'll have about five to ten minutes for Q&A. So as a reminder, if you have a question for Julian and myself, um, and we can get to it and we've got time, uh, we'd love to answer it. So use the Ask a Question button on Bright Talk, uh, and we'll do some Q&A here at the end. So just to, just to summarize really quickly here, um, with new privacy regulations like CCPA, like the GDPR before it, ongoing data privacy regulations we expect to continue. Uh, consent management and data privacy has really become the first touch point with your brand. And so it's key to optimize this experience just as you would any other part of your funnel. Knowing where you need to be compliant will help drive your consent optimization strategy. Do I, do I need to be GDPR compliant? Do I need to be CCPA compliant? Does my brand need to be both? And do I need to provide different options in different areas and geographies? And then we've provided five ways for uh, brands to optimize consent and establish transparency. So like Julian went through the first four here, minimize apt and website uh, impact and maximize uh, the ease of customization or the ease of transparency, the ease of which your consumers and audience can get to their options. Provide a value exchange. So tell your consumers why exactly you need their data in order to uh, make your website experience better. Make sure that your consumers understand why data is a necessary piece for the brand to have in order to make their website experience better, to personalize things, to make sure that they're having the best interaction with your brand, and make that value exchange simple and easy to understand. Humanize your language and uh, understand your audience. So that's a big one I think that Julian spent quite a bit of time on is making sure that we aren't all faced with legal speak, right? When we go back to that Virgin Airlines uh, example and that airplane example that I went through, that's legal speak, right? But it's in a humanized language in a way that I understand that I need to put on my oxygen mask before I put on my child's oxygen mask, right? That, that, is, that, could be, that is a regulation that could be mirrored in legal speak but that I understand very clearly. And so humanizing your language is important, and that goes back to providing value uh, in order for your uh, users to understand exactly what you're doing with that data. Four, bring your brand uh, uh, to your content management experience, and then five, manage consent across the data supply chain. So those are the five things that we've thought of that we thought were important as you're going through and getting ready for the enforcement date for CCPA. Obviously, I'm sure there's plenty more, but five that we thought were key. So really quickly, uh, I wouldn't be a marketer if I didn't market stuff here right at the end. Uh, so if you are interested in learning more about CCPA, uh, we've got an upcoming um, uh, uh, conference, a user conference, our, our annual user conference called Digital Velocity um, in San Diego. So if you're in a cold weather place, we've got sunshine, we've got a lot of things going on. You can go through, we've got early bird going on right now for people who can register, and we'll be talking a lot about data privacy. We'll be diving into some of the products that Celium has. We'll be having some big keynote speakers there as well. So we hope to see you there. If you're interested in this subject in particular, this is your uh, conference. You'll bring a lot out of it, and you'll probably hear more from Julian as well, who's a really smart guy. So you can go to www.telium.com backslash digital velocity backslash San Diego to get registered or just to kind of get an idea of an agenda, see if it's something that's for you. Uh, we mentioned some additional resources, so those are all in your attachments and links. We've got some white papers on CCPA compliance. We've got some solution pages. There's just additional things that you can go into. Um, so you can go either to www.telium.com backslash resources, or you can do the quick and easy way and just click on attachments and links and just click on them there. Same thing with this master class. So Julian and I uh, have done this webinar. We'll be doing a webinar in February as well that you have a link to. And then if, like we said, like we said at the beginning, if you want to see those first two master classes that were put together, you can go to telium.com backslash ccpa dash telium dash master class, and you'll be able to get those on demand. Or again, you could just click on the links and attachments, get right to it there. So uh, with no further ado, again, if you have a question for Julian uh, and myself, please get it in. Um, let's go through some Q&A. Um, can we download the PowerPoint slides later? Let's start with that one because that's an easy one. Yes. <laughs> uh, we will uh, be putting it. It takes about 20 minutes to process these webinars. 
um, probably more information than you want to know. But in that 20 minutes, I'm going to go ahead and attach the PowerPoint into the links and attachments section. You'll be able to access it anytime there. And if you just come back, uh, you know, if you need to go off to your next meeting, come back to this page. That uh, PowerPoint will be there for you. Uh, can you share an example of a non-intrusive CCA banner message? I think that might have come in right as you were going through that first slide. I think we've shown quite a few examples of both potentially intrusive ones and non-intrusive ones. Uh, so if you need more uh, uh, examples, let us know. We'd be happy to kind of walk you through one-on-one uh, -on, -one on some more examples for yourself to go through. Uh, what can you do to help brands overcome the fear of providing transparency into the data and usage and the potential negative ramifications that may have? Do you have any case studies or empirical data to support your position? So let's start with the first one. What can you do to help brands overcome the fear of providing transparency into the data and usage and the potential negative ramifications that may have? So yes, that's a pretty good question. Um, this question was asked to me a lot <laughs> back in the days when we started um, to do the implementation for GDPR. And we're exactly at that point. So the first step is always to have legal descriptions. And then you go from that point on and you start doing analytics with your content management. So the first step in order to overcome that fear is actually support it with data. So me being also a data scientist and not only data privacy expert, I'm in love with data and in order to support my opinion, I always use data and analytics to do so. That means the first step is to actually have insights about what the content manager is affecting. So seeing the drops within data, seeing that the opt-ins or opt-outs are being just heavily impacted by it is something that definitely can be shown internally to represent what actually is happening on the website and how the influence of content management is. Also, to overcome fear, it's pretty simple, is to be straightforward and to actually provide a level of trust towards your users because users using your services are actually already in a kind of trust relationship. If they're buying something on a web shop or whatever they're doing using your services, they already have that expectation of this company is doing something good. So in that adaptation, you should always think about the language that you're using and not only showing what are you actually doing, but always presenting the why. Even if it's just beneficial for your revenue, it's no problem to write and explain that and go into details and explain why it is necessary, why it is optional, why you provide an option to opt out is exactly for that reason. So you can leverage the opt out or the do not sell my data um, journey with the user to explain, we give you the opportunity to opt out of this option. It's just a matter of you taking a decision if you want to provide more to our review or not. So that's like being transparent as much as you possibly can. And you will see that by big brands too. So it's not only small companies that are approaching this on that way, it's big brands that will understand that on that later stage too. Um, as of now, I don't have any case studies or empirical data that I can share. Uh, case studies, there are not much around. Around this topic is pretty new. And empirical data to support your position is kind of difficult to share because it's connected to a company. So I would first have to reach out to them, but I will ask, and uh, maybe it is possible to do even a case study out of the data that I've gathered for the last two years. We could take a look at that. So that's no problem. So uh, just to add on to that, um, uh, the the I think the big thing is the, the empirical data that comes to my mind when I think about that question is the level of which customers and consumers desire trust with their brands. Um, I'm not going to state the quote directly, but there is a Forrester article that I read um, maybe just six months ago talking about the more that brands can provide both personalization and trust in their experiences, the more consumers are going to gravitate towards those brands, right? So think of an Apple, right, where the Apple has done personalization really well, and they're fully on trust. They've done ad campaigns around how much they value data privacy. And so those are going to be continuing to be competitive differentiators in the market as well as consumers go to evaluate their, their options. It's which brand do I trust the most as well as I'm looking across my different options. So let's answer a few more. We're almost running out of time. Um, so Julian, question for you is the do not track setting considered the same as opt out under CCPA? So if I got that question right, do not track should refer to GDPR in general, so not providing content, uh, so opting out of a category. Um, so to put it in simple words, the, 
difference between opt-in and opt-out driven approaches is that within GDPR, you actually have to ask for opt-ins before you can set or activate any tax or cookies. For CCPA then, in reference to that is that you actually can have all your tax stack activated, but you only have to provide an opt-out for the selling of data. So that's the major difference in it. So I hope I've just <laughs> got that question right and I completely got that. So that's about that question. We got another one, which is, is the consumer required to complete an explicit opt-in after 12 months or opt-out on the CCPA? So there is no need to have another opt-in because the user is not opting in. He's only opting out, as just mentioned right now. So after 12 months, what that refers to is that after 12 months, me as a company, I'm actually allowed to reach again to a customer. So show them again the banner or the pop-up or whatever I want to do within it. Um, important it is that maybe this is also a step after 12 months to personalize this stuff and actually activate a real communication yeah. towards that customer and again provide them with benefits and whys and explanation around that. So yeah. after 12 months, I'm allowed to reach out again in whatever manner I want to do that. Yep. I think that's it. That, those are all the questions. We appreciate all of you who have spent, again, your morning, your evening, your afternoon with us. Um, we'll be back uh, for our master class number four. Uh, and thank you so much for your time. We appreciate it. Thank you. Have a good morning.